center and I welcome one and all for uh, an extraordinary event which will be forthcoming. Today we're going to hear from Ernest Michelle. Ernest Michelle's life spans 84 years uh, and during that time period has seen in a lot but much of his career deals with uh, issues dealing with international law, international rules, rule of law. And I, just before we get started, I really do, do want to pause and reflect on what happened five years ago today, September 11th, 2001. And if we could uh, have a, a moment of silence, a moment of silence which would uh, reflect on the lives that were lost and perhaps the issues which have arisen during these past five years. So if we could pause for a second. Thank you very much. I also want to point out on a much more upbeat note that today is the 55th birthday of Randy Sweeney, so if we could sing. <laughs> So if we could sing happy birthday to Randy, please. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Randy. Happy birthday to you. He absolutely exhorted me, whatever you do, Greg, don't mention it. So, heed your words, thank you. Um, we are filming this, so for those who have cell phones, if you could pause and maybe click them off. I'll tell you a quick vignette on me. I did the same story during the Barnett matter, uh, which I told everybody, C-SPAN, everybody was here, please click your cell phones off. And I did so, I purposely clicked mine, threw it over in a bag, and three quarters of the way through the filming of the Barnett case, all of a sudden, ring, ring, ring. and I can't believe who did that. I just can't believe I went out of my way and told everybody cell phone. So I'm telling the story after we conclude, and it's all these people are milling around. And my daughter, who came in from Michigan State Law School just to be part of it, said, Dad, it was probably yours. And sure enough, picks up her cell phone and dials my number. It's call. And so what does what rings over in his bag? <laughs> my phone. Uh, so so that you don't get embarrassed, please turn them off. I'm also, Ernie, tonight, today before I enter, uh, just introduce you, um, to let you know that we had a chance to interview a guy named Sam Adler recently. Sam Adler was at Bowling Green State University, didn't have a chance to meet you, but his father, Herman Ad Adler, was the cantor in Mannheim. I knew him. Yeah. So, in a bizarre sense of things, I'll introduce the Bowling Green aspect of it, but Sam Adler came here, we interviewed him, we talked about his dad, yes, Herm Adler, who was your cantor during your bar mitzvah yes. in Mannheim with Rabbi Victor, right? Rabbi Victor, right. Small, Small world. world. Small world. <clears throat> also, I'd like to introduce the fact that uh, Ernest is here with uh, his wife, Amy Michelle, and I'd like to introduce Amy, who took, she's on her way to Washington to give a major address in Washington tomorrow. Uh, I was supposed to be there today, but because of uh, Ernie's strong feelings towards the Jackson Jackson Center, she bypassed that and came here today. And so to Amy, uh, thank you very much for coming here. If you'd stand, we'll recognize you. Where are you, Amy? There he's up there. Thank you. This event doesn't happen without the sponsors to make it happen. Let me just briefly recognize those. Terry and Les King of King's Heating and Sheet Metal, Chris Smith of Schaffner Minnow and Company CPA, Greg Serto of Truck Light Company, Hadley Weinberg from Weinberg Financial Assets, the congregation Hesed Abraham and its individual members of the congregation represented today by Debbie Greenstein and Debbie Newman, thank you very much, Jamestown Community College Professors Greg Rapp and Frank Harappi, so thank you very much Frank. Uh, Roger Dickinson of Community Bank and from the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation who is uh, 
hosting the William E. and Nancy Jackson Fund, as well as the World War II Legacy Fund, which all support activities here at the Jackson Center. We thank Randy Sweeney and Tammy Bakewell. Um, now to Ernest Michel. I commend to all of you buying this book, Promises to Keep. $15, you will walk away fully understanding this man's singularly unique life, of which we will just get a glimpse today, a brief glimpse. $15, it's out here, and Ernie had sent a few of those to us in advance, so uh, I, I commend that. Why? Born in Mannheim, Germany, in 1923, a man who spent five and a half years of his life in a concentration camp, including Auschwitz, and while there, including interfacing with Dr. Mengele, escaped from the death marches as the Russians were moving their way through Poland and they were moving concentration camp to concentration camp. With guns ablaze and after Ernie, he escaped. The war ends. He then becomes part of an Allied-funded German news agency, Dana. He'll talk about that. He covered the Nuremberg trials. And his byline simply read, Ernest Michel, Auschwitz survivor number 104-995. Hollywood would not possibly get this story because they could not possibly believe that Ernest Michel went and covered the par prosecution of those who persecuted him, exterminated his family, and mm -hmm. almost exterminated his race. His book chronicles it, promises to keep. He came to America in 1946 to the support of the United Jewish Appeal. From Chicago, he ended up in Port Huron, Michigan, and worked for a newspaper there. And his first address, his first address in Port Huron, Michigan, we learned last night, was before a group called Rotary. And as life happens at the Jackson Center, the full circle here today, Ernie, you need to know that we are well populated by the folks from our local Rotary, which I thank you all for continuing to support the Jackson Center. He worked for and became the executive director of the United Jewish Appeal. For almost 40 years he was involved there and had a chance to interface with many of the notables uh, from even Hollywood like Harpo Marx, Jack Benny, Steven Spielberg, and so on. And through that process had a chance to be part of the peace treaty signing with, at the invitation of President Carter, where there's Anwar Sadat, Menachem Begin, President Carter, and Ernest Michel. I think those are the four that I always read about. <laughs> and in 1981, probably one of the capstones of his life, he was intimately involved in pulling together the World Gathering of Holocaust Survivors, an extraordinary event also chronicled in this book, Promises to Keep. I've been tracking Ernest Michel for five years. And he spoke at Dunkirk in 2001. There was a Holocaust event there. And unfortunately, I was unable to attend, so I sent a surrogate who got me this book inscribed by, from Ernie to me, wishing us well. Uh, I'd like to report that from that wish, five years later, we are we're doing fine, and we thank you very much, Ernest, for that encouragement. We tracked ourselves down to Mount Vernon, Ohio, where uh, I feel like a paparazzi who's speaking, and I grabbed him, and I have no idea what that is. Uh, I, think, I felt like I won the slots at the Salamanca. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if we did, keep it going. You would appreciate that, Ernie, as a fundraiser, you know? Somehow, somebody right will, time. Right time, that's right. And in this past year, Bowling Green State University, he was one of the principal speakers, and there we had a chance to uh, interview Mr. Michelle 
he's just an extraordinary individual, and he made the fatal mistake saying, because he's such a fan of Robert Jackson, he would love to come and to waive his fees in coming here. And for that, I was all over him the next day. He didn't know <laughs> no idea. I could go on and on, but we're here to hear Ernest Michelle. And ladies and gentlemen, one of the most singularly unique careers ever. Uh, we are privileged to have in our midst Ernest Michel. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michel. Uh, Greg, in his introduction, can you hear me? I uh, mentioned uh, Rotary Club, Port Huron, Michigan. Sixty years ago, in September of 19... 46, I was working as a copy boy at the newspaper in Port Huron, Michigan, my first job in this country to learn English. And uh, the owner, the publisher of the paper, published a column talking about a young boy from the United States, from uh, um, uh, Germany, who was a reporter at the Nuremberg trial, wrote a column to me about the growing difficult relationship between Russia, Soviet Union, and the United States. And he expressed himself saying, the Russian people are just like we are. He wrote it in his bad English, and that's the way he printed it in the newspaper. That was in September, almost exactly by coincidence, 60 years ago. The next day after it's published, I get a phone call from a student at Port Huron Junior College. He says, we read in the column by the owner of the paper that you are now working at the newspaper. I got a job as a copy boy, the first job I ever had. Uh, would you be willing to come and meet with a foreign relations club that we have in the school to talk about your experiences in Nuremberg and your background, I said, well, come on, I, I just come here. I came here in July. This was my third month in the United States. I spoke a very broken English. I said, look, I can't make any talks. Or any. No, no, you just sit around the table, and we will uh, interview you and ask you some questions. So I gave in. I come to the college, and on the way to the college, he explains to me, it was announced that you would be speaking here, and a lot of people read the column and to tell you the whole student body, about three to four hundred people were sitting in an audience. If I could have dropped into a hole, I would have preferred doing that. I'd never done this before. So he introduced me, uh, Ernest Michel, survivor of the camps, member of trial, and I began to speak. I had no idea what I was going to say. I didn't know what to say, how to say it, how long to say it. After about what I was told later on was an hour and a half, <laughs> I ran dry. There was no water like here now. I couldn't talk anymore. The people walked out without a word. I said, I probably laid the biggest egg in the history of making speeches. The next morning, the publisher of the newspaper called me into his office. He said, I understand you spoke last night at the junior college. And I thought he was going to fire me now. <laughs> Instead of that, he said, look, I'm a member of something called the Rotary Club. I'd never heard of the Rotary Club. I would like to ask you to speak to our club next week, but I ask you to speak for 20 minutes and not an hour and a half. <laughs> so the first real speech I delivered was 60 years ago to this month to the Rotary Club in Port Huron, Michigan. <laughs> I found myself in Nuremberg in November 1945 as a reporter for the German news agency Dana at the Nuremberg trial. I was 22 years old. I had spent five and a half years in the camps. And here I'm sitting as a reporter 
in Congress to explain it. Here I am reporting not further than the second, the third row is Goering and Hess and Keitel and Kaltenbrunner, the Nazi leaders brought to trial. And the first statement that I heard at the trial, I was then on a tryout. They didn't know whether I'd be able to, to, to make the grade as a reporter, but eventually I got the job on a permanent basis. And there a man gets up, the first prominent American I had ever met by the name of Robert Jackson. And Robert Jackson opened as the chief prosecutor for the American prosecution at the trial to talk about crimes against humanity. And it was something that I had never believed would be brought up in a trial in Germany by an American government official. This was the first time I had heard or met a name that has been with me ever since because I remember almost word for word what he said at that time when he opened the trial against the top Nazis. If somebody would have told me in Auschwitz that in November, in November 45 I would be sitting as a reporter for the German news agency, articles being published in every German newspaper about what I saw at the trial, I would have thought that man would have been out of their mind. How I survived five and a half years is something I will never be able to explain. I was kicked out of school at age 13 from public school. I never went back to school again. In 1939, I'm 16 years old. I was arrested by the Gestapo and sent to my first labor camp. My parents took me to the train station in Mannheim where I was born was the last time I saw my parents alive. I never saw them again. They were eventually sent to Auschwitz, where they killed, where they were killed like most uh, Jews were during, uh, during, during the Holocaust. I went in my first labor camp. From there, I went to Auschwitz. In 1900, winter of 42 to 43. I will not talk about Auschwitz. You've heard enough, you've read enough, you know it was the bottom of humankind. The fact that I survived is something I still today will not understand, will never understand, will not believe. Wore the same suit, striped clothing for two years, never saw a towel, there was no water, there was no toilet, we were down to about I was down to probably 80, 90 pounds, and through a miracle, which you will read about when you read my book, I was able to survive. Auschwitz was evacuated. The Russians were coming in from the east. The German, the Allies were coming in from the, from the west. And I found myself in a sub-camp of a camp called Buchenwald, that you may have heard of, the biggest German concentration camp in Germany, and uh, from there, on April 11th, I went on a second death march. The Allies were coming in from, from the west, the Russians were coming in from the east, Germany was getting smaller and smaller. The Nazis did not want survivors fall into the hand of the Allies. They didn't want to do that until we were evacuated. On April 11th, Hearing the sound of the guns with the Allies coming in, the camp was evacuated, 2,000 of us. We went on the final death march. On April 12th, the camp commander announced over the microphone that the warmonger Roosevelt is dead. Remember that date, those of you who are old enough? That's the day Roosevelt died. Now Germany is gonna win the war. In honor of that occasion, the first 10 men at random were put against the woods and shot. This happened every day, 11th, 12th, 13th, till the 17th. On the 17th of April, 45, two friends and myself decided we're gonna make a run for it. 
we didn't survive five and a half years in the camps in order to be shot within the sound of the Allies coming in. We managed to get away. Details you'll see if you read my book. And it began a new life. We worked on a farm to, uh, where we found labor because farmers need work in uh, April, May, was during that time. We worked there. And on April, on May the 8th, as you will know from history, World War II came to an end. I was working with a farmer, and I had a two by four in my hand because it was fi fixing a fence. And I stand there with a the two by four, and the farmer's wife came, and she said, the Kriegs vorbei. The war is over. Mir haben kapituliert. Germany has capitulated. And here I'm standing with the two by four. The farmer is fixing a fence. I gave him the two by four, which kept working. That was the day for me, the end of the war. The day that I had never expected I would survive. What do I do now? I went back to the town where I was born to see whether any one of my family had survived. I didn't know what to do. I had no education. I had nothing. And here I am, coming back to Mannheim, and I began a job for military government as an interpreter, because I speak some languages. And eventually, during my stay there in Mannheim, two events took place, both of them one personal and one affecting my career. One day, an officer of what called the Palestine Brigade, it was in 1945, came to Nuremberg with a stack of envelopes. There was one addressed, and that's why the lieutenant called me into his office, to Ernest Michel Mannheim. No address, nothing. And he says, there's a man who has an envelope for you. He says, it's not possible, it must be a mistake. Nobody knows that I'm alive. My parents, my family didn't, uh, didn't survive. Well, here's an envelope. I open the envelope, there is a letter written by my sister, who lived at that time in Palestine. I had no idea. I didn't know she had survived. And the letter said, and I almost remember it word for word, I don't know whether this letter ever reaches you. I don't know whether you're alive or not. And that was my sister writing to me, and the Palestine Brigade individual brought that letter to me. That's how I knew my sister survived, whose life was saved by Catholic nuns in a convent where they kept her hidden for two years. So my sister and I are the only two members of our family who survived the Holocaust. Let me tell you a happy note. My sister moved to Palestine, later Israel. She was sent on a transport across the mountains into Spain, saved by Spanish soldiers. She married a boy who was on the transport with her. She now lives in a kibbutz in Israel. She has four daughters, 15 grandchildren, and as of the last reading, 16 great-grandchildren. Between my sister and I, we have 71 descendants. And whenever my sister and I get together, we talk about, had our parents only known that we survived and built new families? But that is something that nobody, nobody can answer. The second event took place in, 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 in Mannheim. Uh, the lieutenant called me in. There's a man, Captain Picard, from the American military government who wants to talk to you. He says, why? Well, let him tell you himself. Captain Picard represented the American press and the German press. Germany had come 
totally at a standstill. There was no government, there was no radio, there was no, there was nothing. Everything by, was run by the military government. And he said, look, I understand you speak and write German. I said, yes, I do. We are licensing German newspapers. And we are also licensing a German news agency. And we would like to know whether you would be willing to uh, work for the newly uh, printed German newspapers. Just besides that, there's a possibility, if you can do that, the Nuremberg trial is beginning in November. I had heard about it, that the Nazis were going to be tried, the top Nazis. Well, it intrigued me. I know how to write, I know how to speak German, I didn't speak too much in English, and I said I would be glad to. To make a story that I could spend more time on short, I found myself on November 20th, 1945, at the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg, in the press gallery, sitting with an old suit, that the only thing I had left, and I've become now a reporter. And not far from here, the first rows sits Gerwin and Keitel and Cal. All the top 21 individuals now on trial for what they did and what the Nazis did. And I'm sitting there. I wanted to jump down. Why did you do this? What had I ever done to you? My parents, my education, my life, my friends. No, I'm a reporter. And I have to report from the trial. I did this for about five or six months, reporting daily from the trial. And I insisted that my byline, which appeared in every newspaper in Germany, said Ernst Michel. Dana correspondent, former Auschwitz inmate 104995, which is a number that I have tattooed on my arm. And those articles appeared. It was incongruous. The contrast between seven months before escaping from a death march and now a reporter at the trial. There are Two events that stand out in my mind from that time. One day, the Russian prosecution showed a film called Auschwitz. The rooms went dark, and there on the screen is the camp that I was in, the barracks. This was filmed by Russian army photographers who liberated Auschwitz on April 27th. 1945. This year, for the first time, the United Nations had a commemoration of that day when Auschwitz was occupied, liberated rather, by the Allied, uh, by the Allied forces. The world has changed in some ways, in some ways it's getting worse. The second event that stands out was the time Rudolf Hirsch, not to be confused with the deputy to Hitler by them, Rudolf Hess, H-E-S-S, appeared on the witness stand. And he declared, as a witness, he was a commandant of Auschwitz. I'm 46 years old and have been a member of the Nazi party since 1922. I estimate that at least two and a half million people were exterminated. He used the German word ausgerottet, like you kill animals. Another half million died from hunger and disease. Hearst did not tell the truth. It was not two and a half million, it was one and a half million only, including my parents, who were killed in Auschwitz. He exaggerated. He eventually was sentenced in Poland and hanged on, gala, on a gallow, erected in the camp, facing the camp, 
and that at the decision of the Polish government he was hanged. The third event that I recall of all the days that I spent there was when I had a meeting with Hermann Göring. Now that's again one of the incredible things that, uh, that, you keep, that just happened. Every one of the Nazi defendants had a defense attorney. Göring's defense attorney was a man by the name of Stammer. Now, as I said earlier, all my articles appeared in the papers with my byline. And he, during a recess, he took me aside and he says, are you the one who is writing the stories for Dana at the trial? I said, yes. I am. You were in Auschwitz and Buchenwald? I said, yes. Well, we are all reading your articles. The defendants were only allowed German newspapers. They were not allowed, allowed phone newspapers. That's the only thing they read. And Goering said, who is this man, Ernst Michel, who is a reporter for the German news agency and who now writes about the Nuremberg trial? So he said, it's me, yeah. Well, I want to ask you something. Goering would like to know who is this man? And I would like to know, would you be willing to meet with him? Well, I almost fell on my chair. And I figured, not only am I a survivor, I'm also a correspondent. I'm a reporter. And here I'm going to have an interview with Hermann Goering. So I agreed. One day after the session was over, Stammer took me downstairs into the bowl of the Palace of Justice, where they have their cells. And on the way he tells me, look, I have to tell you something, I'm taking you there on my own responsibility. Uh, I'm not allowed to do that, but I worked it out in such a way that you could join me as a member of my staff. The only thing I can ask you, this meeting between you and Goering is off the record. You cannot talk about it, you cannot write about it, it did never take place. Well, I was so nervous, I hardly listened to them, because now I'm going to meet Hermann Goering. Takes me to the cell, the cell opens up, and there is Hermann Goering, the fat Reichs Marshal, the number one defendant, the number two man in the Hitler hierarchy. And I said to myself, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> I mean, I'm going to ask Mr. Goering, how do you feel? How, would, uh, how do you react to the trial? I could not get a word out of my mouth. I could not handle it. I turned around, never said one word. The last thing I saw Goering standing there, and I walk outside, asked the MP to let me out. That was my meeting with Herman Goering. <laughs> Until today, I, will, I have never regretted having walked out and leave the man standing there because I don't think I could have handled it. As you well know, the trial was over in, I think, in August 1946. By that time, I was in the United States. I had decided I could not stay in Germany and I decided to come to America. I came here in 1946, and I told you earlier about my first job in Port Huron, where I learned uh, English, and from here on, I began my career here in the United States. I will never know how I survived. I will never understand it. The odds were totally against my, my, my having done that. I'm a very lucky person. Not only did I survive, but I built a new family. My wife is here with me. I have grandchildren, and I told you earlier how many my sister and I have, 71. But I made, at that time, a decision 
that I believe, and some people have told me, Ernie, you survived for a purpose. Maybe that's true or not. I'm one of those who can talk about it. Not only can talk about what happened, because I thought, I said very little about Auschwitz, on purpose. No point in talking about the horror of that happened. But I, somehow or other, and uh, I hope you might agree with me, I can communicate with audiences. I enjoy particularly speaking to non-Jewish groups. I speak at universities. I speak at colleges. I speak at high schools. And I have been able to do this ever since I came to this country. This is how Greg heard me in uh, Bowling Green. And that's when he asked me whether I would come here. And I'm delighted to spend the anniversary of my coming to this country, in particular on a day as meaningful as this, to be able to talk to you about the things that happened. The Nuremberg trial was the first time in history that the leaders of an elected government, a Western civilized government, were brought to trial for crimes against humanity and waging war. The first time, and it was led by a man from this town by, by the name of Robert Jackson. I've been asked, and I've asked myself, what are the lessons of Nuremberg? That was 60 years ago. It's become a major event in world history. A new word has entered the language since then. That word is genocide. Now, I'm not so sure how many of you know how that word came about. It was coined by a lawyer from Poland by the name of Raphael Lemkin, who lost his family during the Holocaust and lived in New York. He became obsessed with what happened during that time. Now you should know, genocide, and he coined that word. It was part of the life of the 20th century. Churchill coined it a crime without a name. It is now genocide. What does it mean? Genocide means the killing, starvation, rape, murder of millions of innocent people for religious, political reasons, or no reasons at all, on the orders of an elected or self-appointed president of dictators, or dictators. 170 million, 170 million men, women, and children have been killed by homicide since the beginning of the 20th century. That is half the population of the United States, half the population in Europe. Not in a war, by genocide, by willful killings of people, men, women, and children, starvation, you call it. In 1948, the United Nations adopted what is called the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. How did it come about? Raphael Lemkin cornered every prominent individual he could find. He was a lawyer. Members of Congress, ambassadors of European countries, religious figures, wealthy individuals, prominent people, to try to get support for the resolution that I mentioned to you, which was passed in 1948 at the United Nations, now supported by 136 nations. The crime of genocide. That's what we're talking about today. Lemkin got a hold of an individual that you may know, remember the name, William Proxmire, the senator from Wisconsin. He was the first prominent American who listened to him.
Proxmire convinced the Senate and the Congress to support this resolution, and it was passed, as I said, by 136 nations and is now part of the international law. He died in, in the 1950s, totally unknown. He was nominated five times for the Nobel Peace Prize, never received the honor. Seven people came to his funeral. He died an unknown name, and yet his name is something, is someone that we must remember. It was through him that today there exists in The Hague, the International Criminal Court, of which the United States of America is not a member. Neither is the Soviet Union, neither is Russia. Two of the very few countries that have not signed up for over 100 nations are part of the International Criminal Court. Remember Milosevic? He was tried in The Hague for three years, three years the trial lasted, and as you know, he died while in jail. We have the instrument today to deal with it. But here's something else. What is genocide? Genocide, genocide is a product of hate and of evil, of indifference, of political inertia, of moral bankruptcy. That's genocide. It's hate that is practiced by individuals for whatever their reasons are. Example, when I grew up in Germany, there was a song that the SR sang as they marched through the streets. When das Judenblut vom Messer spritzt, geht's uns noch mal so gut. If Jewish blood spurts from the knife, we are better off. It starts with songs, with speeches, with articles, and hardly anybody ever believes them. Had anyone believed when Hitler in 1938 said, if international jury will be able to begin another war, it'll be the end of Jewry throughout the world. Written, said publicly, it begins with speeches. Recently, the president of Iran said Israel should be wiped off the face of the earth. A member of the United Nations talking about another nation that should be wiped off the face of the earth. We live in a very, very dangerous time. Maybe some of you recently heard the uh, statement by the number two person in, uh, of the Islam, of Al-Qaeda, who said, all Americans must join the Islam. Some of you have heard it? I heard it on television. If not, the consequences will be very severe. That's what's going on today. We are living in dangerous times. It's Western civilization and Islam, one against the other. It is something that we must be aware of, that we must know and deal with. We are living in dangerous times. Nobody knows what's going to happen. A few weeks ago, you saw what happening in the Middle East. The Middle East is only a small part of it. It goes way beyond that. It attacks us as Americans, and it attacks the way we live in freedom in this country. What did Nuremberg mean to me personally? I've lived a very, very interesting and positive life trying to do something about that what's happened to me and my generation would never happen again. Nuremberg, with all it represented, 
was the greatest, most satisfying, most rewarding meeting and event that I have ever been able to participate as a survivor of one of the greatest tragedies in human history and as a newspaper man to report from that. Ladies and gentlemen, I enjoy discussing this with you. We are talking about something that affects all of us. And unless we are aware of it, there remains a question, what will be the outcome? I'm an optimist, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And as an optimist, I believe that we, 300 million strong, will be able to find a way to overcome the danger that is on the horizon. But Greg, if it's all right with you, there may be some questions in the audience about what I have raised. And if there are, I would be very glad to, uh, uh, to respond to it to the degree that I am, uh, am able to do it. I hope you'll speak up loud. My hearing isn't so good anymore. My wife thinks I need a hearing aid. I've been fighting it ever since. So if you repeat some of the question that I may not hear, I'll be glad to deal with it. First of all, let me just pause and say, wow, Ernest and John. Before I take the first question from the crowd, I'll ask uh, the prerogative of the first one to be mine, and that is, uh, we had a chance to just briefly talk last night about how your feelings towards Germans. Uh, being a Holocaust survivor, obviously covered the Nuremberg trial, you saw the atrocities. Uh, it was memorialized through Robert Jackson's prosecution at the Nuremberg trial, and here you are today, uh, 60 years later, uh, kind of a moment of reflection. Uh, interesting question, Greg, <clears throat> and I give you my interesting answer, I believe. Uh, I probably have more, race, more reason to hate Germany and what it stood for than anybody else. They've taken everything away from me. Luckily, I was able to survive. I do not believe you can live with hate. There's so much hate in this world today that uh, I find it sometimes impossible to, uh, to deal with intellectually. I don't hate Germany. I don't hate what the Germans did. I will never forgive. I will never forget what they did to our people, to my family, to my friends. But we live, and I call myself uh, a follower of realpolitik, the reality of the world in which we live. I do not believe that the deeds of the parents should be put on the children, on the, on the backs of children. I have today relationships with Germany. I visit Germany often. I have dealings with leaders in the government. The government of Germany today has recognized what took place during the Hitler era and have tried to make amends. More Germans visit Israel than any other people other than from the United States. There are clubs in Germany, Israel-German clubs. The Holocaust is being taught in every school in Germany. It's part of the curriculum. They have to learn about it. Germany has paid hundreds of billions of dollars in reparation. I receive every month from Germany about $550 for the rest of my life. They'll never pay me for what happened to me, never for my youth. But I have a, I believe that you have to deal with what you have today. You cannot deal only with what happened a generation or two generations ago. And therefore, the answer to your question is, Greg, 
My relationship with Germany is based not on what happened, although I want to make it clear, I'll never forgive the Nazis, I'll never forget what happened, but I believe Germany today is a different country than the one that uh, was during the Hitler era. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Uh, Ernie, what she asked was, there are two individuals who uh, you escaped with, yeah. and I wonder if you kept track of them. Yeah, they, they've been with me throughout the year in the camps. Uh, one of them saved my life because in, uh, in, in Auschwitz I developed because there was no, you know, I wore the same suit for two years. There was no laundry, there was no washing, there was nothing. I developed typhoid fever. And he washed me up five times a day with cold water. So one, they're very close. We were just as close as can be. We planned the escape together. We thought of how we we're going to do it. And the only way we could figure out to do it was to do it during a rest stop. So on April the 18th, when I uh, mentioned that we ran away, the SS also had to uh, to sit down for a while, you know, could leave, walk all the time. We were down with probably 90, 100 pounds, not more than that, hungry as hell. For two days we planned, how can we do that? On April 18th at noon, there was a rest stop. If you pardon me for putting it this way, we put our pants down and moved slowly in the back into the woods. And, and a given signal, we nodded and we ran. They shot after us, but at that time in April 1945, less than a month before the end of the war, even the Germans, even the Nazis knew it was the end of the war. Germany was getting smaller and smaller. And after about 15, 20 minutes of running through the wood, zigzag, you know, so we wouldn't be, they wouldn't be able to, to get to us. The three of us stood in a wood in Germany, and for the first time since I was arrested, we cried. We were free. There were no guns behind us. It was a feeling that is indescribable. Of the three of us, Hanzo comes from Czechoslovakia, developed a heart condition, and he died three, four years ago. We spent every 18, April 18th together, Amy and I, and his wife, and he, having dinner, going out for a big dinner, going to a show, you know. The third one was lost. Never heard from him. Did he die? Didn't he die? And in my book that I wrote, and you'll see it on the, on the back page, uh, I assumed that he was dead. And yet, when my book came out, somebody called me up. He says, Mr. Michel, you wrote about Felix Schwartz, that he died, that he disappeared. He's not dead. He lives in Port Matilda, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> says, what? So how do I get a hold of my call of the operator? Do you have a Felix Schwartz in Port Matilda, Pennsylvania? He said, yes. Give me the number. I call up the number. The man answers the phone. He says, Felix Schwartz? He says, yes. I'm Hans Michel. He says, who? Do you know me? He says, Felix. Do you remember Auschwitz? What? He forgot everything that ever happened. Never married, never had a real job, went from one thing to another. He is a victim, despite the fact that he was able to survive. Now, I, with me, you know, genes, call it whatever you want. With me, it's different. Hanzo and I celebrated our survival. Felix knows from nothing. I never, I met him once, he 
try to shake hands with me. I wanted to give him a hug, you know. He's a victim just like many of those, most of those who died. That answers your question about what happened to my friends. Other questions? Yes. question is about the United Nations. It's the only United Nations we got. We haven't got another one. The uh, earlier organization was, was formed after World War I. What was it called? <laughs> That's it. Uh, went out of business. The United Nations was created. It's not working well, making many, many mistakes. There, is, uh, there are more resolutions passed by the, the 1,701 resolutions since the founding, over half of them are against Israel. Yeah? That's just another sideline. So I would have reason to say they're ineffective, but I'm trying not to, because it's the only machinery we got. Ineffective, yes. Talking, yes. Deeds, very little, but some. For instance, the recent situation in, uh, in the Middle East, they are now talking about 15,000 uh, uh, troops from throughout Europe to guard the southern part of, of Lebanon. Uh, I wish it would be better, but it's not. But it's the only, th the only thing we got left. Questions? Jim? Do you have a position about the current dispute that's raging now with the detainees receiving basic rights Speaking about, for example, the 14 have been brought back to Guantanamo, some kind of basic rights, the argument that has been raging. An analogy being used to Nuremberg rights, is it valid or not? I get the question. I give you my own personal opinion. You may agree or disagree with me. That's the beauty of living in this country. <laughs> I tell you how I feel. I believe that we live in a different world today than we did 20, 20, 30 years ago. And we have to react, I believe, differently than we did then. And while I value probably more than most of you the freedom and liberty in this country and it has given to me and to everybody, I believe that certain steps have to be taken. I don't know how far they go but certain steps have to be taken to prevent what happening in Europe, in London, and in Madrid, and in countries throughout the world, in order to protect ourselves. And if that means losing some of our liberties, then I would say, if it is going to help us, we should consider doing that. Now, fortunately, in this country, we have a Congress, we have a Senate, we have uh, our elected leaders, and eventually they are the ones, including the Supreme Court, that has to decide how far this can go. I know it's a debate. I gave you my own personal opinion. That's all I can say about it. One final question? Yes. Uh, your question was, well, what do you foresee as the, um, maybe the end game as we, Islam versus the, the West? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's the question today. i give you again my own personal belief. I believe we are on the verge of World War III. Yeah? I hate to say that. But it's them or us. The hatred that exists, and I can quote to you, I get every day in the press, in, by email, the pronouncements in the Islam Muslim press. You would be amazed what they say. Kill America. Make them kill the Jews. Uh, they quote George Washington of having been the greatest anti-Semite in, uh, in, in existence in this country. 
Fra uh, Benjamin Franklin, same thing. Out of nowhere. You've heard of uh, blood la a label? Blood label, libel, blood libel. Blood libel was created in the, during the six, 15th, 16th century, where Jews were accused of using children and taking their blood to make matzah that use, Jews use on Passover. Yeah? Every day, obviously, it never happened. Still repeated till today. A minister of the government of Syria came out publicly a few years ago that blood libel is still continuing until today. Any normal individual would, uh, would say, where does he get it from? We would do this to make, first of all, well, anyway, no point even arguing about it, yeah? Those are the lies that are being perpetrated. And the Muslim press prints these things on a regular basis, inciting hatred against the Western civilization. And the last statement that I mentioned to you that, uh, that I heard, when he says, America either become Islam or you will th uh, suffer the consequences. We live in a crazy world. It's upside down. Their books have written, the Holocaust never happened. They're telling this to me. Who was there? The gas chambers. Never happened. The president of Iran, the one who said, wipe out Israel from the face of the earth. The hatred that exists, and on a positive note, let me put it this way, wouldn't it be so much easier, and I remember this on television, there was a guy, in, a black man in California. Couldn't we all live together? Wouldn't it be better if we could all live together in peace and harmony? I remember that man who was, uh, uh, you remember the story in, in the West Coast? Uh, couldn't we all live a bit together? Well, I hope we can. And being an optimist that I am, I think we will find a way out of it. And to help us, God, I hope it will happen soon. Thank you.